Good evening. I'm Ron Burgundy, and this is what's happening in your world tonight. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Ever wonder about the companies that know everything about your financial identity and your credit? On today's show, we'll share with you the hidden secrets of the credit bureaus as we talk to the author of Credit Worthy, Josh Lauer. Also, with an important headline about identity protection, a guy from one of those bureaus, from Experian, Michael Bremer. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky caller, take one of your letters, and more. And now the icing on the cake, please help us welcome, from the amazing Brown Ambition podcast, our special guest host on today's show, Mandy Woodruff. Mandy! Hey, how's it going? It's better now that you're here instead of OG. Welcome back to the basement. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be back. Yeah, it's great. You've, you've done so much with the place. <laughs> right, right. We have the same posters, the same shag carpeting. We did clean up for you. So when a guest comes around, we clean up. I appreciate that. Yeah, but do you know what we do exactly the same that we used to do every time you've been here? What's that? We still talk about how amazing Magnify Money is. Because when you go to Magnify Money, the average person there saves about $450 between higher interest and lower fees. Did you know that? You know, I do know some of our marketing points. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, probably not as good as you. So but no, it's great. Thank you. So yeah, so when you go to Magnify Money using our link, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money, what you'll find is whether you need better student loan interest rates, maybe you have to have an auto loan instead of paying cash for the car because you need wheels, or you're looking for better credit cards to either pay down the debt more quickly or you pay off your debt every month. You know what that means? You can then play the rewards game. Use stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money to get there. Because you shop for everything. Why wouldn't you shop those financial products you use every day to get those things? Stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Mandy, by the way, for people that don't know you, Mandy, the three people listening, you run sure. this. I've heard Magnify Money has a decent blog. Like it's okay. It's I, you know, we try. Um, yeah, I I can't believe I've been here. I just celebrated my one year anniversary. Have you really? And we got acquired all in one week. It's been kind of a crazy week. Yeah. That's so um, amazing. Things have been going swimmingly. Yes. And for people that don't know, well, now they do because you kind of said it offhand. Mandy is the executive editor of the Magnify Money team. And you guys have some really good investigative reporting stuff going on now. Yeah, since I've joined the guys here and myself, I've been really investing in good personal finance journalism. So not much different from what I've been doing in my career, but just more resources and more people to help me cover all the interesting facets of personal finance. So it's really been fun and it's been fun to grow our team and it's been a solid year. Can't complain. But that's not it. The way Doug introduced you is the way we should talk about you. Co-host of the amazing Brown Ambition podcast. Yeah, my baby. Let's talk about my baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Brown Ambition's doing great. Me and Tiffany, the budget nista, who you know well, I'm sure your audience knows well, right. couldn't ask for a better co-host. The show is bigger than it ever has been. And it's such a, you know, our audience is so loyal and supportive and has just been uh, keeping us going for the past couple of years. I, I can't believe it's been two years. I just wish you guys had fun making it because your shows are so non-lively. <laughs> You don't have any interesting conversations. It's horrible. You know, sometimes I do forget that we're recording and I'm like, do people, why are people are just listening to us have a conversation we would just have normally. So no, I think that's part of the appeal. It's, it's sort of, I always approached it from like, let's talk about money, how we usually talk about money. We talk about the latest episode of, you know, Game of Thrones and Desperate Housewives or God, why am I bringing up a show that's not even on the air anymore? Desperate that is so <laughs> Real Housewives. <laughs> I was a huge Desperate Housewives <laughs> fan, apparently, in 2002. Um, yeah, we just talk about the kind of stuff that we talk about. And then, you know, we get to the money and the career stuff, and it's just a fun show to, to tape every day well, or I'm every week. I'm glad you're here with us today because we're talking to Professor Josh Lauer from the University of New Hampshire, who's written this book called Credit Worthy. Do you know anything about the history of these credit agencies? I know nothing. I know that it wasn't even a thing, like the FICO score, the credit score wasn't even a thing until the 90s. And it's crazy how in such a short span of time, we all became so obsessed with it, which I think in some ways has helped and hurt us. Yeah, I'm totally there with you. I'm sure we'll talk about that more later. So we've got Josh Lauer 
We've got your letters. We've got the Haven Lifeline. But first, we've got a couple amazing headlines. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. In our first headline, this one comes to us from CNN Tech. Jeff Bezos, familiar with him? You ever hear that name? Heard of him. Yeah, no, mm. I can't quite place He's him. doing all right. <laughs> He's $5 billion away from being the world's richest person. It says, watch out, Bill Gates. Jeff Bezos is gunning for your title. Thanks to a surge in Amazon stock, the company just announced it's buying Whole Foods, of course. Bezos added another $1.8 billion to his net worth. $1.8 billion, he can't live on that, but it's a good start, according to Bloomberg. <laughs> He's worth $84.6 billion. Did you see that meme going around Twitter about the Whole Foods buy? The one where Bezos says, hey, Alexa, buy me something. <laughs> buy, me <laughs> yeah, something I did that one. buy me something on Whole Foods. And Alexa says, buying Whole Foods. And Bezos goes, oh, shit. <laughs> Alexa's great. No, it's crazy. I, those numbers don't even make sense to me. I love how it's like only $5 billion away. I mean, that's basically the GDP of some small countries. That's like not jump change. But I think Amazon, I mean, I am such an Amazon fan. I can't be mad at them. Like I would completely be fine if, Am- if Amazon just ran everything eventually. That's My it. 401k, the public transit, just take it all. You know, it's going to be low fee. It'll be there quick. You know, they'll take care mm-hmm. of everything for you, right? We're going to live in a Wally society and you'll be very happy, Mandy. But but I pulled up this list of the richest 10 people in the world. And what was amazing to me is that if, if you want to be uber rich, what do you think about this? Can we learn something from this? If you want to be uber rich, it seems like you can't work for somebody else. You You have to have to get off the bench and go play your own game. Yeah. I mean, I think that the lesson from these lists are, you you know, and even just we're having covered business for so long is the wealth is where people are creating it for themselves. The true wealth is when you're able to invest in businesses or create your own business and then spin that into new wealth. And I mean, you see it all the time. These, these angel investors, these venture capitalist firms, I mean, that is their, their business. They see an opportunity, they get in early and they multiply their money and they just keep on reinvesting that money and going and going and going. It also seems really exhausting to be a billionaire. Not going to lie. No, it does. I mean, seriously, they say, you know, this work-life balance thing. I don't think you can have work-life balance if you're going to go to be a big time entrepreneur like these people. You know what? I was reading something recently about, I forget who the quote was by, but it was like, I would never want to, oh, I know who it was. It was Malcolm Gladwell talking about how he'd never, he wouldn't want his kids to be geniuses. And I'm sort of equating genius with billionaire here. I know that's not always the case, but you know, these people are sort of seen as, they call Warren Buffett the oracle of investment, you know, these geniuses and stuff. But when you look at geniuses and their lifestyle, like on paper, it doesn't sound that great. I mean, they are a hundred million percent focused on work, 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 building wealth all the time because that's what it takes. And I'm on the other sort of side where I'm like, can I just have, you know, a house and some money and not have to worry about money? That'll be good enough for me. And I, and I feel like that is maybe I'm trying anyway to sort of reach like a healthier mindset when it comes to, to building wealth. Well, I think that's where stocks come in because we've had this statistic on the show before where less than half of people in America who are investors own stocks or eligible to be investors Mm -hmm. own stocks. And I think that if you're not going to try to be one of these people, you want to be more the lifestyle that you're talking about, Mandy. It's like you have to own stocks. Like if you don't own yeah. stocks, stocks are the way to get a piece of this without having to do all the work that Bezos is doing. Absolutely. I mean, you don't even have to think about it. I haven't thought about it very much. I mean, I've been investing since I was 24 and I already have a sizable retirement fund, not because I'm like a genius, but just because I started early putting away my little 10 percent of my teeny tiny you know, entry level reporter salary. I mean, I'll give you an example. I left last year, I left Yahoo and I've been gone for about a year and I left, I haven't even rolled over my 401k yet. It's just, just kind of hanging out, you know, in a Vanguard account. I've earned like $6,000 this year doing absolutely nothing, doing zero things <laughs> to build wealth just in that account because it's sort of been sitting there and growing of its own volition. And that's a great feeling. Boy, and what's funny about that, that this leads me to another thought, which is, I had uh, these clients back when I was a financial planner. They had forgotten. So I get this I get this stack of these dead accounts that are with American Express, meaning mm-hmm. they, they can't find the people. They got no idea, but they hand them to me, newish guy, and say, hey, these are yours. If you can find these people, that's great. Maybe you can start a relationship with them. I find these people. They have one mutual fund 
And it's gone from next to nothing in the late 80s when they had it all the way through the 90s. It roared up. And then I think I'm calling them in 1999. And it's a growth fund. So in 1999, you know, growth funds are doing 50, 60 percent. And so these people, I think that they started with five or ten thousand dollars and it was like ninety five thousand bucks. They they have forgotten, Mandy, that they owned it. And when I found them and I told them how much money they had, they couldn't believe it. (laughs) So when they left it alone, the thing grew amazingly. But when I started that relationship with them, guess what the first thing is that they did? Started tinkering. Immediately started, to, not even tinkering, just all of a sudden there were these amazing bills that they had that they hadn't had when they didn't have the money, right? They had right, never, yeah. And, and I'd say within three years, almost all that money was gone. It was gone. They, they totally just spent it all. Oh, it was horrible. It was just, just leave it alone. Sometimes I wish you could just wipe my memory or wipe anyone's memory of the money they're putting away. Like it's just, and I try not to think about it. My husband's actually really bad about this. I mean, he has a thrift savings account. He works for the government and he's like, babe, uh, it's doing really well today or it's down today. I'm like, it's a retirement account. Could you not, it's not, you're not a traitor. Stop pretending, just stop. (laughs) Like literally you have index funds, calm down. But I, I don't crave that sort of like, daily knowledge. It kind of stresses me out. So what works for me is just don't even think about it. Pretend it's not there. And it's a happy surprise, hopefully, in a couple decades. And in our second headline, a new identity theft survey out from Experian. And joining us on My Dad Shortwave, Michael Bremer, Vice President of Identity Protection at Experian. Michael, welcome back to the show, man. Thanks, Joe. I surely appreciate it. Well, let's talk about this because I got to tell you, when I read the results of your survey, I was very disappointed. Well, I would be too, because, you know, people still aren't getting it that less than half of the folks don't think they're going to be a victim of identity theft. And they also think that 72% of them think it's only going to happen to wealthy people who have lots of net worth. Yeah. Can we go through some of these? I want to ask your opinion on why you think that is, but I want to start with this big one. 84% of people acknowledge that they're concerned about their security of personal information, But two-thirds agree it's, quote, too much of a hassle to constantly worry worry about it. What do you think that's about? What's going through our head, Mike? Well, a lot of people will talk about going out to exercise, whether they're sleep-deprived or anything else. They just can't get up in the morning to go get to the gym. This is the same thing, although the consequences of not taking any action and protecting yourself, like with – our Experian Identity Works product it has much bigger consequences than just not going to the gym. Yeah, right. And, and this whole idea that the threat of identity theft, when you mentioned this, this idea that the threat goes away over time, the threat over time heightens, doesn't it? It becomes more of a threat. Exactly, Joe. Once your information is out there and it's been compromised, you can't get it back. And in fact, Separately, if you've had one instance of fraud, I don't care if it's credit card fraud or someone's opened an account in your name or something else, you're 25% more likely to have further identity theft if you don't address it the first time around. What are some of the important things people should do to help protect their identity? Most importantly, monitor your transactions. Many bank, online banking and credit card companies that have an online portal will automatically alert you for transactions over a certain amount. You can set that up. Take a look at your credit report. Make sure you have good passwords, long, alphanumeric, upper and lowercase characters. Shred all your documents. Don't use public Wi-Fi. And for sure, don't share any information of personal nature on your social media account, like putting up your driver's license of your kid. Look, my kid just got his driver's license today. Do do you? Yeah, yeah, I just can't imagine, but you wouldn't be saying that if somebody hadn't done it. We see some of that stuff all the time. Unfortunately, people are uh, creatures of habit. Unfortunately, bad habits. Yeah, yeah, right. Last question I wanted to ask you is about some of the changes in the credit card industry. And I know that credit cards and debit cards now are coming out with a feature where you can turn the credit on and turn it off when you're not using it. How do you feel about products like that? Actually, our Experian Identity Works, the new identity theft protection product, you can have that feature in your Plus product. So you can turn on or turn off 
access to your file with a flip of the button on the app. So, you know, the last time you were on, I had a lot of people write to me and say, why would somebody use one of these products versus just shutting off their credit? Because as you know, I can just tell Experian, I can tell TransUnion Equifax just to shut it off until I want it back off ice. What's the difference? Well, the big difference is that if you go ahead and you're not aware that you've shut off your credit and you keep it off for a while and somebody's trying to go ahead and, let's say, vet you for employment or you're actually trying to legitimately you know, get a new car or something like that, you're going to be denied and not know what's going on. And with our product, you don't have to call anybody, but you can do the same thing without having through going through that hassle of actually placing the freeze. Gotcha. I was curious about that, and I know many of our listeners were. Mike Bremer, thanks for hanging out for a few minutes. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Michael Bremer from Experian. Mandy, isn't that amazing? Half of people think that over time you're less likely to have an online attack. <laughs> really? With all the news I out there. I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we've never been more likely to have an attack than we are now, uh, or a case of identity fraud. That's crazy. It is crazy. So I think our l- number one lesson is that protect yourself online using the, some of the things that Michael talked about. Lesson number two, you want to be rich? You probably got to have your own business. Well, if you want to be in the top 10 in the world, you probably got to have your own business. But you want to have a balanced lifestyle. I think you got to own some stocks. Got to own some stocks. Josh Lauer is an associate professor of media studies at the University of New Hampshire. That's a, have you been to New Hampshire? I've never been to New Hampshire. Are you calling me out? I, well, no, I've never been either, but I want to go. Okay. <laughs> I, I still want to go. I, I mean, go to... I've heard it's nice. <laughs> it's a, me, me too. You should do a live show in New Hampshire. Especially, in the, especially in the check fall. Check it out. Yeah. Mandy and I will come to New Hampshire in the fall. Somebody invite us and we will come there to do a show. His historical studies of communication, technology, surveillance, and financial culture have appeared in Technology and Culture, New Media and Society, and several edited collections. His new book is all about the history of our credit, which I find absolutely fascinating. Can't wait to talk to him. Let's say hello to Josh Lauer. And Dr. Josh Lauer joins us in the basement. Welcome, man. Nice to see you. Well, I'm glad you could include Texarkana in the worldwide tour for Creditworthy, because this book to a finance geek This is like porn. (laughs) I'm glad to hear that, I suppose. (laughs) I don't mean to make you uncomfortable right away. (laughs) I'm just disappointed for you that there aren't more pictures. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, of credit ledgers and stuff (laughs) in the ages, right? Well, I never thought about it before, but there must have been somebody evaluating credit way before even the United States was formed. Like this idea of deciding if somebody's credit worthy, how old is that? Well, probably as old as there is debt. I mean, the main difference is obviously the world has changed quite a bit since uh, the dawn of time and societies have gotten much larger. So it's uh, much more difficult to figure out who is who, who, if their actual identity matches up to who they say they are. And if that person is who they say they are, whether they're trustworthy or not. And in the early days of the United States, I can't imagine how people like collected data about people. Was it more subjective? Like, I like that guy, so I think he's probably worth it. That's exactly how it was. So you have to ima- you have to imagine a society where most people don't travel super far in their lives. Most communities are rather small. Most people work in agriculture. So the world of your lending for a lot of people is the people that you know personally or know somebody who knows them. So you know, imagine your lending world is your family and your family's friends, and how you would determine whether or not you would trust someone in that circle. And so. It's completely subjective. You know something about where they work, what kind of house they live in, and you can infer something about their income. And more importantly, you might know something about whether they tend to be honest and whether they work hard and whether they're the kind of person who would actually follow through and pay you back because not everyone does. But that seems to me then that there were a lot of kinks in the system, like the system was pretty ugly in the early days then. It could be. So if you were someone that people in the neighborhood or in the town didn't like, you were at a significant disadvantage. People wouldn't want to lend to you. But it was also more complicated than that because 
you know, human beings are complicated. And so there might be somebody in town that you know is a jerk and maybe drinks too much and is just unfriendly. But if that person has a reputation for honoring all their debts, paying on time or working hard and having an income, then some of those other attributes might be overlooked. But of course, I mean, there were prejudices against different people for sure. And and then that's one of the arguments for something like statistical credit scoring, where, where you have some of those prejudices screened out. In the very early days, you talk about how they had ledgers and you have a photo of these ledgers where people have different scores. How did the ledger come to be? So the idea of having a ledger is the idea of ledger experience. During the late 1800s, uh, you have merchants in towns throughout the United States starting to realize that if they start sharing their histories, their experiences with their different customers, they can figure out who is has a pattern of paying their debts on time in a regular way and who doesn't, rather than simply having a customer and not knowing anything about them. If you pooled all of your information together, you could have a, a broader, deeper picture of different customers. So the credit bureau forms for consumers in the 1870s and 1880s. And so maybe the local grocer, the local tailor, local physician, a department store, they start sending their records of all their credit customers and whether or not they've paid and how many debts they have to the credit bureau. All this information is compiled and then some sort of rating system might be devised to indicate whether a person pays promptly or pays slowly or is behind in debts or somebody you should only take cash from and shouldn't trust at all. These were not entirely empirical or sophisticated systems. I mean, they were basically letter symbols indicating these broad categories of trustworthiness. But if you had a rating book, for example, with a customer's name and a series of letters that might indicate that six local merchants said the person paid on time, one person said they were slow, and one person said, don't give them credit, you might look at that and think, well, on balance, you know, overwhelmingly, this person seems to be trustworthy. But it's not, you know, black and white by any stretch. What type of person was in the credit uh, business in the early days? It seems like, you know, the know-it-all down the street was a person that really wanted to take that job. That's a great question. So the first real systematic credit reporting started with companies like Dun and Bradstreet. So Dun and Bradstreet are literally the first organizations they merged in the 1930s to become the corporate credit rating firm that they are today. But they were two separate companies in the 1840s competing. And their system was basically to ask different attorneys, lawyers in towns throughout the United States to write up a list of all the people in business in town and write down something about their assets, uh, their work habits, uh, their reputation in the community, and to send all that information to the central office where it was compiled. So the first credit reporting organizations, the first credit reporters were attorneys. And uh, some of these attorneys were famous people. For example, Abraham Lincoln uh, served as a correspondent for a credit reporting agency. The more famous uh, early credit reporting figure, so he's, he's famous for that, <laughs> in addition to being president. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the first people who were involved in consumer credit reporting, so the real credit bureaus during the late 1800s, they were a mix of different trade groups. So you have local butchers or grocers in the town getting together and organizing and collecting information. And you also have private organizations, so entrepreneurs who are trying to uh, set up a credit reporting organization like, you know, modeled on Dun & Bradstreet for commercial borrowers and trying to make a, a living doing it. But it's, it's a really hard business to make money because unlike commercial credit reporting where your clients are banks and financiers and big wholesalers, companies with a lot of money, the subscribers for local credit bureaus initially are companies like, uh, you know, well, they're not even really companies, they're mom pa stores like right. grocers and tailors and uh, shoemakers, things like that. These are businesses that don't have a lot of money and can't pay a lot to uh, you know, support the entire operation, which is super labor intensive. What if you found out in those days, Josh, that something was wrong on your on one of your credit reports? Like, you know, right now we have a system of disputing your credit, right? What happened then if you found out that there was something bad? Good luck. You'll you'll never find out. It was incredibly secretive. So really, until the late 1960s, the passage of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is a really important uh, set of legal restrictions or legal aids for consumers. Before this time, if you um, had a problem with your credit report, so 
way back in the early part of the 20th century, you could go to the credit bureau and you could try to speak with the manager and explain things. But there was no protocol. You had no legal recourse to ask any questions to get any information. And in fact, credit bureaus encouraged different stores not to tell uh, consumers why they had been denied credit, what the reasons were. They didn't want them to know too much about their credit records. Why? They didn't want them to complain or they wanted to keep the, the veil down? I can't understand why they wouldn't want that. It was a completely different system. They really felt that the consumer was the enemy and that they would try to come in and trick you. And uh, the credit bureau felt very strongly about their role, almost like a, a law enforcement function. And they, they, you know, they saw themselves as sort of being like the FBI of the business world and didn't feel that the consumer had equal rights in terms of you know, coming in and asking questions about what was, what was in their file. Another reason is because unlike credit files today, credit files before 1970 sometimes had information that was just pure gossip. So uh, one of the things that was very controversial about credit reporting during the 1960s when uh, the big congressional hearings uh, took place was that it turns out that a lot of the information or some of the information in credit files, at least in the 1960s, but certainly earlier, had to do with your personality. The cornerstone of creditworthiness until the 1960s was personal character. And this was emphasized over and over and over again in the professional trade press for credit managers, credit bureau operators. So how could you possibly know what a person's character is? Well, you can't. But if you're collecting information about a person in the neighborhood and they say, well, this guy drinks too much, or this guy, we know he has at least one or two girlfriends on the side in addition to his wife, and uh, philandering was a big red flag, not necessarily for a moral reason, but the idea was if a person is supporting more than one woman, it's going to be more expensive. So it's, it's you know, a lot very of money, right? sexist assumption, but a um, <laughs> good part of the calculation. Uh, certainly, you know, hanging around with criminal types or being assumed to be a lazy person or a difficult person. These are just, you know, personality traits that could make it into your credit file. And uh, so that would be another reason why a credit bureau wouldn't want to share the information in there because it could be, you know, embarrassing or really damning and could open them up to a slander or a libel suit. Where did the big three credit reporting agencies start out? When do we start seeing them come on the scene? There were thousands of local credit bureaus in the United States all the way into the 1970s. So, you know, 2,000 or more individual local credit bureaus. And it's really not until the 1970s and 1980s when, through computers, all these little small paper file local bureaus are bought up by computer giants, and you had this you know, winnowing down to three major credit bureaus. The roots of some of these credit bureaus go back quite far. So Equifax, for example, was started in Atlanta, Georgia in 1890s. It's the same company all the way through. I believe um, Experian owns part of a company through some mergers that was also started in the 1890s. But for the most part, you know, the big three are really a product of uh, computerization and you know, a bunch of companies buying out uh, other small bureaus and starting their own. So, for example, TransUnion was a rail car company in Chicago, and they just decided to diversify in the 1960s, bought some credit bureaus, and then started gobbling them up and had a, a big credit reporting organization. This move in the 1960s that you talked about with you know getting rid of some of the gossip and standardizing the way your credit report looks, I know before that, I mean, I could just imagine the discriminatory lending that's gone on. Do you think that, that there's still discriminatory lending or and are there still problems with the system or have we, have we done a great job of wiping that out? Well, that is a great question and it's a really difficult one because there are two ways of looking at it. On the one hand, it definitely makes things better in the sense that, you know, you can try to screen out for race and for gender and for marital status. These are things that definitely hurt minorities and women during the 1970s, you know, earlier before credit scoring becomes pervasive. So this this is a good thing. So it's it's more equal in that sense. It's not so great because some even though we have ways of screening out these very explicit variables that we see as discriminatory, they still sometimes show up or they could show up as an artifact in statistical samples. So it might be that in certain neighborhoods where minorities live, you know, there are lower credit scores that might be associated with race or with a geography, which might correlate onto a lower income neighborhood. So it's not entirely eradicated in that sense. But the other way that I would 
say, and maybe this is counterintuitive in a way, to say that credit scoring and these kinds of automated techniques hurt people is that they're completely impersonal. So the old way of getting credit, you would go to the local department store and the bank and sit down with a credit manager, literally sit down with a human being, and he or she would look you over and take your application and write down information about you. And if there was something that sort of wasn't quite right or looked a little suspicious or awry in your application, you could explain it in a reasonable way that, you know, if it's true, would make sense. But of course, you know, with everything being automated now, it's you enter information online or give information to a clerk. And if there is some sort of conflict or information that would be helpful to explain a some other problem in your application, there's no way to respond to that. And so in that way, the impersonal aspect of it probably hurts some people. How safe is our life in the hands of these three big companies? Because before I even knew your book existed, I never thought about the fact that they know everything. And it seems to me they're not credit agencies anymore. These are big data selling firms, right? Yes, and that has become a huge problem. And it's not just a problem starting today. One of the interesting and maybe not surprising in retrospect features of uh, the Computerized Credit Bureau is that they were rich targets for early hackers. So during the 1970s, you have a couple of big credit bureaus getting hacked or being compromised by insiders you know, who are sharing information. And you have thousands, millions of individual credit files being stolen. So it's not just that they have all this information, but it's like any other database that, you know, all you have to do is get in and you get it all. And it's, you know, it's not hard to get it. Unlike if you're trying to break into a business that has a bunch of paper files, it's a a different kind of theft. Boy, that's scary. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) Was there anything when you were writing the book that particularly surprised you? I know, I mean, you're an expert in this area already, but was there anything while you were researching that you just went, this is this is mind blowing and something that people really need to know about when it comes to the history of credit? The whole thing surprised me, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I didn't come at this thinking that I was you know, originally interested in, in credit reporting or credit bureaus. I was interested primarily in the way that people talked about their personal income and the ways that they try not to talk about it with each other. So I thought, where would be a good place to study where people talk about their personal income? And I thought credit bureaus would be a good place to look. And it turned out that there was no information really about the history of credit bureaus. So that's how I ended up going down that particular rabbit hole. But what really surprised me the most was how much information was being collected and how early that information was being collected. So again, unlike today, credit bureaus are not allowed to be keeping information on file about your drinking habits or your mental states or your, you know, whether or not you're getting divorced and, you know, what your relationship is with your wife or husband, that's off limits. But for most of the history of credit reporting, that was central to the file because even more helpful than whether or not you paid your bills, your personal character, your personality, how you behaved and what other people thought of you was really sort of the most insightful way to figure out whether you were going to be trustworthy going forward. So the thing that you know, sort of was shocking looking back is realizing that not only did credit bureaus have so much deeply personal information about your life, your personality, your domestic arrangements, but they also would also help law enforcement if they asked about it as well. Um, So uh, many credit bureaus during the early part of the 20th century and even into the 1950s and 60s, they had desks in their bureaus where the FBI would come or the IRS would come and you know, work on the files and and look at the information. So, you know, we have this idea that surveillance is really about the government collecting information and a big central database where the NSA is looking at things. But long before any of these things were a problem, you had these private sector organizations that were collecting seriously uh, invasive information and, you know, using it for a legitimate purpose in terms of deciding uh, credit worthiness and credit risk, but also lots of other ways that this information can leak out and be damaging in ways that you have no way of knowing about or even preventing. The book is called Creditworthy, and it's uh, Columbia University Press. Where do people find the book? On the internet, Amazon, at Columbia University Press, Powell's Books, all over the place. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks so much for having me. Hi there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and all this talk about credit has me wondering what my score is. While I head down to the Payday Loan Center down by the Sizzler to check out my score, here's today's trivia question. 
what is the best month to buy stocks? Historically speaking, of course. Stackers, we get used to those same daily routines, don't we? We wake up at the same time every morning, brush our teeth, park the car in the same spot at work every day, recite jokes in the mirror to be funnier than that jerk of the water cooler. Or is that what, just me? Here's one thing you shouldn't make routine, using the same credit card from the same bank just because that's what you've always done. Nick Clements from Magnify Money explains why. I mean, it's never been a better time, honestly, to find a credit card, especially given the lucrative sign-on bonuses that are out there. Chase just recently had 100000 on their reserve card. I think we're at a point right now where credit cards are extremely profitable for large banks and they are really wanting to get more customers. And so they're, they're rolling out the red carpet. So I would just say, if you have had a credit card for more than two or three years, chances are there's a much better deal out there for you today. So why stick with that same old card with those rewards that haven't changed in years? You can use magnifymoney.com to always find best in class, including better interest rates. And don't only use Magnify Money for credit cards. Nick and the team have built the site from the ground up to help with personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. Average person saves $450 in interest when they hit stackcabegements.com forward slash Magnify Money. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Welcome back to my trivia. And I promise we'll get there in due time. But first, the question needs to be asked, what's the scale for credit scores? Are we talking like a one in 10 sort of deal here? And is like, is one the highest or 10 the highest? On a more alarming note, is the scale one to 100? I ask this because the guys down at the Payday Loan Center told me my credit score is sitting at a reliable 10. Sounds pretty darn good to me. I sure hope those scores are on a scale of 1 to 10, though. But let's get back to the real reason you're listening, my trivia. Historically speaking, what's the best month to buy stocks? Well, because I am fully qualified based on my online degree from Southwest Bahamas State Technical Institute and Beauty School, I can tell you September is the best month historically to buy stocks. I can also tell you, you might want to pay close attention in October. Do the years 1929 and 1987 mean anything to you? Stick with September, folks. You went for sell a May and go away, and not quite. Not quite. Womp, womp, womp. You could have said a steak knives, Mandy. Thanks uh, for playing. <laughs> It's not my style to pick a day to, in, to sell or to buy. I just kind of do it look and at, hope. Look at you, girl. Ask Scott. me when I'm 65 if I did a good job. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they've been spearheading innovation, Mandy, spearheading innovation within the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most. What are the two things you value most? Oh, tacos and my husband. <laughs> How about your family and your time? So your husband, you got half of it. All right. But tacos. I spent a lot of time with both of those <laughs> things. So <laughs> That's why they've created a high quality and most importantly, affordable term life insurance policy issued by Mass Mutual that you can purchase entirely online. No need to wait several weeks for a decision when you could get one instantly with Haven Life. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and to learn about life the modern way. The stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. And guess what? We don't have anyone on the formal Haven Life line. So we went to the basement, our closed Facebook group. And if you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash green room, you'll find out about uh, how to click through to get there. But this question comes to us from Carl. We'll throw out the lifeline to him. He says, online shopping tips? He says, no matter how much he Googles, he always feels like there's a better price hiding out there somewhere. I always feel that same way. I'm looking for a great deal on a laptop or a tablet. Mandy, you are the ninja with online deals. Yeah, I'm kind of obsessed. It, tell you, it takes me forever to make a purchase online because I, will, I have to check all my sources. I have no fewer than three different Chrome add-ons that I use, and they're amazing. Um, Ebates for cash back, for one thing. Honey is one of my other favorite apps. Honey is the one where you go to check out and you can click it and it'll, it'll alert you to any promo codes that you might be missing out on. And if this guy wants to comparison shop, I say add the price blink add on if you have Chrome as a browser, because price blink will tell you if it, find, especially it's great for gadgets or appliances. If you're shopping for something and it finds it somewhere else 
$5 for less on the web, it'll tell you where to go and get it. I did this with my mom for Christmas last year. I was about to spend like 150 on a Ninja blender thingy from Target. And I checked price blank and price link sent me to wayfair.com where it was like a hundred bucks. I couldn't, it was awesome. Oh my God. So those are my three. Wow. Those are fantastic. Honey is the one that I I've seen lately all over the place. That's a cool app. Yeah. They really, I've been a fan of theirs for years, but I think they've just like really pumped up the marketing, which is nice, but I heard about another one. And so if you want to, if you want to get like a, um, you know, use these apps to get cash back or to get deals, there's one called goodshop.com and good shop. Actually, I, I just heard about it last week. A portion of your savings is donated to charity. So you can pick which charity you're aligned with. And then if you, if you use their app, um, you can at least feel a little better about yourself for doing some shopping online. We've also had the guys on from uh, benefit mobile. So if you put in uh, benefit mobile into your phone and bring up that app, you can right at the register, pull up a uh, gift card, but they give you a discount on the gift card. So you can pay using a gift card that isn't an actual gift card. It actually is just a it's it's right on the app. So you just give them your screen. They shoot it with their little gun. Is, is, is that what they call it? Is that the technical term, Mandy, the little gun? They shoot it with that. And then yeah. you end up with like another 5% off or whatever it is. So even after all that, we can get even more. That's just crazy talk. I can't tell you how, I can't tell you how many Amazon or sorry, Visa or Amex gift cards I got from my wedding and I have no idea where they are. I'm lost them all. Oh. I'm like, what? You, why did you give me these easily losable objects with money on them. Oh, <laughs> like, it's so that, annoying. That kills you. Thanks for the question, Carl. If you've got a question and want us to throw out the lifeline to you, it's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. You know what you do? You just go to stackingbenjamins.com and on the top of the screen, it says question for the show. Click that baby. And then right down below it, it'll say Haven Lifeline and uh, we'll record a voicemail and there you go. You'll be on the show. We also get letters. Doug just brought down the mail, and he's got this one from our brand new friend, Clay. Clay says, hey, guys, thanks so much for the show. You're hilarious, and your content's made me more confident in my investing and my financial future as a whole. With that being said, still know I got a lot to learn, and I've got a question about the impact of expense ratios in the long term. You want to get down with some expense ratios, Mandy? Hot stuff. Let's do it. This is, this is just, this is like the most exciting topic we could do. My it's top... 1,000 things to talk about. Expense ratios is on that list. I found out I was paying significant fees for active managed sector funds, financials, industrials, biotech, when I could have just invested in exchange traded funds. By the way, what Clay doesn't know, there's exchange traded funds that invest in biotech. So you can have an exchange traded fund and biotech at the same time. It's like you can have your ice cream and the cherry on top. There's so many flavors. It's so exciting. There was nothing niche about those funds to warn a manager, so I decided I was going to sell them. All of those had an expense ratio of 0.5 to 0.75, and I turned around and bought exchange-traded funds to cover the same investments. There was a lot of redundancy, so I put the majority into an S&P 500 index fund, which, of course, had a lovely 0.04 expense ratio. So here's his question, Mandy. He says he had some capital gains when he sold that. But he's in his early 30s and he's got decades left in the market and he used some expense ratio calculators and saw that he'd be leaving money on the table if he didn't sell. So he's thinking that it was good to take some capital gains now and save on the fees moving forward. Was his logic right or was he a total clown? He said, if it's a ladder, let her rip. So are we going to let her rip all over Clay? I don't think we need to. Like you said, he's in his 30s. He's got a long, as long as he's investing for the long term, he's got a few, maybe even four or five more decades ahead of him in these investments. So I say it was worth it. I mean, it's hard to predict the future. You don't know how much you're going to gain over time, but I'm, I'm guessing it was probably enough to justify selling and taking that capital gains hit. I think so too. And I think you're going to pay the capital gains tax sooner or later anyway, right? I mean, you're going to pay it. So right. it, it is, it's a little speed bump. I mean, I know that if he had more money, if he had more money in the fund, it would compound more quickly, but you're right. If he used an expense, he says he used an, ex, it, he did the right thing by using a calculator ahead of time. Yeah. It sounds like he knows what he's doing and knows where to get the information that he needs and, and made an educated decision, you know, and that's the best we can hope for. I feel like 
if you spend too much time worrying and, and asking a ton of questions, I mean, you sort of get frozen and you don't make a good decision for yourself. And I think he went ahead and just did the, what he thought was a healthy decision. And you got to, I mean, investing is like 95% what you know and like 5% luck. Or maybe that's opposite. I'm it's, a, <laughs> it's a bit luck, right? Absolutely. But I'll tell you this. I do like the fact of, yeah, you already said it. I mean, get to a certain point, do your homework, get to a certain point. At some point, you just got to jump, right? I had clients when I was a financial planner that would talk and talk and talk, and we'd never do anything. And it would just kill me that we'd never make a decision. Just make a decision that's 95% right and hope like heck that... Uh, that, that it works out. Hope like heck is not the best, most confident phrase. Pray that it well, works I, out. <laughs> hope like it, definitely. That's why it's important to stay diversified. One thing goes wrong, you're not going to lose the farm, as they say. Yeah. If with an S&P 500 fund, what's the chance of the 500 biggest companies in the nation going under? I, I also think, you know, there was this, uh, there was a guy I was talking to recently, he was talking about the S&P 500. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy that is going to go up. It, here's the reason why. It's because if a company... If the valuation gets too low, they get taken out of the S&P 500 and they get replaced by one that actually is moving in the right direction. So the S&P 500 is hmm. always going to have a majority of companies that are the movers. So if you want if you want like a self-cleaning self-cleaning index, the S&P 500 is that. I never thought about that. That's a good point. Yeah, I thought Hell that was yeah. cool. I am a little annoyed though that we couldn't beat up on Clay cuz he gave us permission to beat up on him and we can't. How bad is that? I think he just wanted us to tell him how smart he was. I know. Clay, you're the smartest. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> you're the best, Clay. You got it going on. Clay, we have a t-shirt coming your way because you are the smartest fan on the Stacky Benjamin Show. How's that? Is that good? Yeah. Uh, Clay, write me back and we will send you a t-shirt. Hey, thanks to Clay for the letter. If you've got a letter for the show, it's joe at stackybenjamins.com. But once again, the Haven Lifeline is empty. You're in the front row. If you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, people, Mandy, are also nice enough to give us reviews of this show. Can you believe that? It's amazing. Absolutely. Reviews are important. This, this is the world of reviews now. How are people going to know if Stacking Benjamins is good if a million people don't think that? I know. Come on. So this one's going the rating up. rating is everything. This is going upstairs on mom's fridge. And it is from Brenda0922. Five stars, Brenda gives us. Says, even millennials can understand these guys. Can you believe that? A couple old guys like OG and I. That's a little rude. That, that is just <laughs> like, come on. Even millennials can understand us. She says, got serious about taking charge of my financial future about one year ago and started listening six months ago. So glad I did. Joe and OG explain things in simple terms so that even millennials like me can get motivated and educated funny, entertaining, and not overwhelming and not boring. They also do a great job of answering questions in the green room on Facebook and through the Haven Lifeline, which we just did. Awesome. And sometimes we have very smart people like Mandy come on, so we look even better. I think we I mean, did. I did you a lot of favors, I feel like. <laughs> I think you totally did. You have seen. No, it's such a pleasure to come on and chat with you. We're, we're, we're mutual fans, so it's nice. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's coming up on the Brown Ambition podcast. Thanks for hanging out with us today, by the way. Thanks. Um, well, while we're preparing for the pending wedding of my co-host, Tiffany's getting married. So excited. That sounds like a, that. We have an awesome show. That, that, oh, did, I, did I skip over that point? No, I'm just saying that sounds like a movie. Like Tiffany's getting married sounds like a movie title. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm really excited for her. She and I have sort of been like planning weddings, two different, you know, she's on the let's go to city hall and I'm on the let's have a destination wedding in Savannah, Georgia kind of train. So it's, <laughs> so people will get like a taste of two different styles, I would say. Um, no, I'm really thrilled for her and we'll have updates on that. And then next week we're doing a travel edition of the show. We've got the founder of no madness coming on to talk about summer travel tips, how you can save and how to maximize reward points when you're booking. So excellent uh, shows coming up and you can catch us at brownambitionpodcast.com. Awesome. And if you're walking the dog or out on your morning run, we'll have a link on the show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Hey, thanks everybody for playing. Coming up on Friday, another roundtable discussion. And guess what? In the Friday FinTech, we're talking about jobatical. Talking about, by the way, travel, Mandy, listen to this. What if you could travel the world, but have jobs working in different parts of the world and just go from job to job to job and work around the world and let your employers cover your travel costs. That's what Jobatical is all about. And we're going to talk to them in our Friday FinTech segment in the middle of the show. Thanks for playing. Go stack some Benjamins. So what did we learn today? First, your credit. 
Maybe it makes sense to learn a little about the organizations that know a ton about you. Protecting your credit is important, and understanding how companies look at your credit is a key to keeping your identity safe. Second, want to become wealthy? Yeah, who doesn't? While you can cut expenses for a while, the real secret to success is to focus on your earning power. But the big lesson? Before you go bragging to the ladies at the Sizzler about your credit score and how you're a perfect 10, know the scale ahead of time. Apparently, I can score like something like 800. Where the f*** did that score come from? This is ridiculous. Special thanks to Josh Lauer. You can find his book, Credit Worthy, in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. And a big thank you to Mandy Woodruff for stepping in for OG. There is no way I could have talked to Joe for an hour. Thanks for jumping on that grenade, girlfriend. You can listen to Mandy's show at brownambitionpodcast.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes. Not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. And a big no thanks to Forbes for skipping over this guy for the top 10 richest people on the planet again. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. Tell me, Mandy, being on the show, that's fine. But actually making it to the after show, this is like, this is it. This is next level. I didn't even know this existed. So I feel like I've just discovered a new planet. This must be how NASA astronauts feel. (laughs) Wow. This is, we're here. So for those of you new to the after show, what happens here stays here. We don't talk about it. You can't talk about it. We've had people, Mandy, accidentally talk about it. If you have to talk about it, call it dessert, all right? Just tell people, hey, I like the dessert portion of the show today. And uh, then our little club stays a little club. But we love talking about movies. We talk everything except finance. If you're here for finance, bye. We'll see you next next episode because we don't do that here. Uh, instead, we're going to talk about a movie that Mandy saw that I haven't seen yet. And this was a recent film with this weird name called Bay- I've never heard of Baywatch. What's Baywatch? Let's listen. Our team is the elite of the elite. We're the heart and soul of this very beach. We protect when other people don't want to protect. And we go above and beyond. If you want me, you can have me. Some other time. We're staring into the abyss here. City Council's already cut our funding. It's up to us to restore the Baywatch brand. I'm Matt Brody. Ready for duty. Can you just uh, look at my boobs? I. You should look at my face. I'm trying, but it's so close to your boobs. Yeah. Mandy, did you just look at my boobs? Are you sitting here staring at my boobs? I'm not going to lie. It's very distracting. <laughs> They're, so... They're very, very distracting. <laughs> I'm up here, Mandy. Just keep your eyes up here. So Baywatch, what's this movie all about?
Let me think. Um, Baywatch. So I watched this, I think like a lot of us did after it was already off the air, just in syndication, you know, when it was on whatever network it used to come on. The movie is pretty similar to the show, except with like way hotter people, way more body oil and like a lot more drugs. Um, but it, it stars my, my fave, my man crush, Dwayne, the rock Johnson, who I have been watching since he was the rock. And he is, he's Mitch. He's David Hasselhoff in the movie. And he is in charge of a group of like the extremely beautiful models who are lifeguards on the side (laughs) and need to save this very, like need to save this beach town from an evil sort of drug kingpin played by Priyanka Chopra, I think is her last name, that really beautiful Indian actress. So she comes to town and she's a baddie, she's a druggie, and they got to save the day. Well, who doesn't want to see Dwayne Johnson save the day in slow motion? That sounds like a complex plot. It was surprisingly easy to <laughs> to boil that down. <laughs> I, I bet this is a complicated movie with a lot going on. Yeah, you know, I really left thinking afterward and I wrote in my journal afterward just to sort of unpack <laughs> all of the the ideas and themes in the movie. To see if you um, could... To so s- many different undertones. <laughs> to see if you could get the subtext. No, it was... Yeah, there's just so many little hidden things and, yeah. you know, they really they really talk about the family aspect of all working together and the science of a good dick joke was just amazing <laughs> to, because <laughs> there are maybe 20,000 jokes in this show that have to do with the male anatomy and just to, sh- to see how creative they could be, how many ways you can make that happen. No, it was awesome. Yes. It's everything you want. It's Baywatch. It's hot people in swimsuits. It's Dwayne Johnson. It's a crazy plot, and it was fun. That's what I was going to ask. So you you paid money, paid real money to go see this movie at a real Actual dollars. theater. Yeah, they ex- Actual dollars. I did not even use a discount coupon or anything. And just, yeah. just paid retail for Baywatch, and you're. it sounds like you're actually giving it a thumbs up. I would give it a thumbs up, you know, leave your brain at the door, get some popcorn, bring some girlfriends, you know, and just go have a good time. It was, it was like two hours that was just fun. I got out early from work only on like Memorial Day weekend and, uh, and just happened to go and want to see it. So it's super fun. I mean, you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna leave any dumber than you probably were when you walked in. (laughs) Is that a good, I should be a movie critic. (laughs) I bet they're going to put that on the DVD. You won't be any dumber after you watch this <laughs> than you were before you watched. I'm sure they're listening to the show now. Hoping yeah, you to- might want to like, you might want to do some crunches, but <laughs> I left out feeling pretty good. I, I want to do crunch. Every time I see The Rock, I'm like, I'm so out of shape. I got to get into better shape. You know, we were having, Shannon, our community manager, and I were having this discussion that, you know, a lot of people that kind of look like The Rock, like there's this, there's this stereotype, right? That, that they're really self-centered and look at me and into them. And he kind of goes exactly the opposite way of that, which is, which I really, really, it makes you like him more, you know? He's got an uncanny ability to be extremely self-centered without making you feel like he's self-centered. Right. You, got, you got to follow this guy on Instagram. I mean, he's the, he's obsessed with, I mean, every picture is himself at the gym or working out, but then, yeah, I totally get it. You read the caption and you read what he's saying and you're like, Oh, he's talking about how he just saved a kitten from the tree outside and he came in for his workout (laughs) afterward or, or, Oh, he's lifting up a child who, you know, could was blind before and now can suddenly see, you know, like it, he's so likably perfect. I don't know. It's such a, it's such a rare like quality in, in a human. I mean, I should he be deserves- annoyed. I should be totally annoyed by him and I'm not at all. There's also something like that sets you free when someone's that perfect. You're like, well, I'm never going to be that perfect. So it almost removes the threat, you know, Forget it. Right. like I think you become more competitive with people like in your lane and he's on a whole different planet. So it's kind of like, oh, there's that alien. That's cool. I was reading a thing about him when they, they call it a thing, by the way, a thing about him. I was reading a thing about him when he was working on Fast and the Furious about how professional he is and about how he, you know, he shows up on time. He knows the script. He's got like he is a leader on the script. He's not just a good actor. Like that's why people like to work with him is because of the fact that he helps other people do their job better, too, which is uh, also annoying. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like been known for saving. He pretty much like saved the Fast and the Furious franchise. He brought they brought him back for Baywatch. Like, 
I mean, he's he's definitely, and he, he has to be nice to be as successful as he is. I mean, that just doesn't come from being like a jerk. I mean, he has so many different TV shows, so many different movies and companies. I mean, he is like a mogul and unto himself. I think he deserves respect for like being a businessman. I totally agree. First and foremost. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people go, well, he's the rock and he, you know, he was on, well, to even make your way to be as successful as he was there in that career before he did the current career. It's just amazing. Is he still the highest paid actor in Hollywood? I think he is. I can't think. I mean, either him or like Robert Downey Jr. Don't they kind of like swap places back and forth? If only Mandy, we did machine where we could look that stuff up. But we're too lazy. (laughs) If there was some way that we could know. just, yeah, just don't feel like typing right now, though, so. Well, thanks for hanging out a little longer and for the great Baywatch review. Yeah, thanks for the the dessert, quote unquote. 